This morning, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 18 through 24 today. This message is called the drive of life because the very direction that we are going, and we're going to see the motivation in our life. And in this passage, there are two mountains that are compared or actually contrasted. And that's Mount Sinai with Mount Zion. And the writer of Hebrews chapter 12, we see, beginning with verse 18, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sounds of word, sound of words which sound was such that that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them, for they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. That passage is describing Mount Sinai, and that is describing the, when we see the people were filled with terror, what was happening was the giving of the law. As Moses would go on to Mount Sinai, but God came down, didn't he? And, and, and the, the sight there that you can see in Exodus chapter 19 and going into Exodus chapter 20. You know, I think it's important leading up to that. What was Israel doing before they even approached Mount Sinai? Well, they had been complaining and said, we're going to, you know, did we come out of Egypt to starve, to die? Was there not enough graves or areas in Egypt to be buried? And here we are. In Exodus 15, there was a great song celebrating God's deliverance and opening up the Red Sea and leading them out of bondage. But you see in Exodus 16, they start saying, Lord, are, are, are you going to provide for us or not? In Exodus 17, we're thirsty. Is there anything to drink? There, there's no water. How are we going to live? We're going to die. In fact, Moses said they were ready to stone him. They were complaining and they were distraught and, and, and they had failed and so quickly moved on from what God had done to bring them out. About three months later, here they are. And God came in such a scene there at Mount Sinai that there would be fear that the people would not sin against him. To reveal himself in such a mighty way. But the people said, you go and you tell us what the Lord has spoken. We, we cannot bear to hear him ourselves. And the Lord had gave the parameters. So even the beast could not come up and touch the mountain. The giving of the law. Warren Wiersbe wrote that God had to impress on his people the seriousness of his law, just as we must with our own children. This was the infancy of the nation, and children can understand reward and punishment. God gave the law because he loved his people, and he said, here's the purpose. You are to be different than the nations around you. You are my people. I am your God, and you are to obey me, you are to listen to me. We were covering that this morning in our Sunday school class in Deuteronomy 4. And, and what was the idea was to listen to what God said and to obey him. But how did they do? You know, at first, remember, they would say, all that you have spoken, we will do. But it wasn't very long before they had turned away from the Lord and started worshiping other gods. Worshiping the other gods of the, of the people. And God said, you are to be my distinctive people. Here's the law. But they didn't keep it. 
Well, in fact, in the Old Testament, you're going to find not only with the Ten Commandments, but you have the social laws, the, the religious laws, the various things. You have 613 of them in the Old Testament. And some say, oh, hey, I, I keep those. To, yeah, have you ever heard somebody say, oh, I, I, I keep the Ten Commandments? When you start seeing, and even nine of the ten repeat in the New Testament. And you start dealing not only just the action, but also the attitude. Then how did the people do then? Lining up. They might say, I, I'm keeping the law. No, they're not. In fact, here's the honest truth. Every one of us are guilty. The law is valuable, not in providing salvation. The law is weak and, and is not able to bring us to God. But why is the law so valuable? The law is valuable bringing us to Christ, showing us our need for the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that we are sinners. The law kind of acts like the mirror, revealing to us that we have fallen short. We have sinned. But just like a mirror can reveal, I can look into a mirror and see that I left shaving cream on my face. Can the mirror get the shaving cream off my face? No. But that's not the job of the mirror, is it? The job of the mirror is to give that reflection to reveal the Old Testament law reveals the reality that I'm a guilty sinner needing grace. God's grace needing the precious blood of Jesus Christ as we were singing that wonderful hymn. There's nothing that can wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So you have the people that were filled with terror. Now go to go to Galatians chapter 4, what the apostle Paul would write. We're going to begin with verse 21. I have on your notes Galatians 4, but uh, chapter uh, 4 verse 24, but we're going to start in verse 21 and go down to verse 27. You see, the believers in Galatians, there was a group, the false teachers called the Judaizers, had come and were started troubling these new believers and saying, it's not, a, you know, salvation by grace through faith alone isn't enough. You need to, to be circumcised. You need to keep the law in order to be saved. And Paul was saying, believers, why have you departed from the teaching of grace? Why have you departed so quickly? Who has bewitched you or who has tricked you? And so this was going on in the church there, the believers in Galatia. And so what happens in Galatians chapter 4, the apostle Paul is going to deal with the law and the purpose of the law. In verse 21, he asks a question. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who uh, are not in labor. For more numbers are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. 
So those that are coming in and saying, oh, you need to keep the law in order to have salvation. And he was going to use, the, and Paul used the example of Hagar and of Sarah, the bondwoman and the free woman. And there were those that were saying, oh, my righteousness can come from keeping the law. The type of Jesus, there were those that added to the law called the Pharisees. And they thought that they could achieve righteousness. They're a part of the kingdom. We don't, know, we don't need the righteousness of Christ. We're the sons of Abraham. Because we're the sons of Abraham, we can go into the kingdom. We don't need redemption. What are you talking about sinners and, and needing to be born again? Remember Jesus saying in John 3, Nicodemus, a respected teacher of the Jews, an upright moral man. Jesus looks to him and says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot, unless you're born again. The spiritual birth the new birth. And he goes on and describes, and he says, how can I be born again? Can I enter into my mother's womb again and, and, and be born? And he says, he's thinking physically, isn't he? He's thinking the physical birth. Oh, there's the physical birth, but there's the spiritual birth. Born anew. And the reality is, we don't go to heaven without that new birth. And those that were depending upon keeping the law and having the righteousness from the law. Well, Romans 4, the apostle Paul would use, as Abraham said, it was said of Abraham, when God showed him and he looked up and believed and he saw the stars and, and God said, so shall your descendants be. And the Bible says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Was Abraham saved by works? No, he was saved by believing God. He was saved by trusting in God alone. In Romans 4, Paul lays out that we are justified, declared righteous by faith alone. It's not by the works of the law. So he says in Hebrews, the emphasis at the beginning, you have not come to a mountain. You haven't come to Mount Sinai. In contrast to that is Mount Zion. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem. Are you looking forward to heaven? You know, I, I love that great hymn. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. And then the one verse talks about our laboring here on this earth. Oh, it's going to be worth it all. Amen. To see the Lord Jesus Christ, heavenly home. When you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you've passed from death unto life. You have an eternal home. Oh, as Apostle Paul wrote, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You may be here today and say, my body, I just have so many physical issues going on and pains and all the various things. And here's great news. The apostle Paul in that same passage in 2 Corinthians 5 says, we have a body eternal in the heavens, not made with human hands. We're going to get a new body. I'll be honest with you, sometimes, last several weeks, I told Lisa, I said, I, my eyes changed. It, that's just something. At 49, your eyes change. Isn't that something? My eyes changed and I've been having trouble seeing the notes. And I said, you know, the good thing is about heaven, we're going to have perfect vision. We're going to have perfect vision. We belong to Mount Zion. 
Mount Zion here is not the earthly one in Jerusalem, but God's heavenly abode, which is inviting and gracious. God had to say to the people, don't come near, don't touch, don't come or there'll be death, even of the animals that would touch Mount Sinai. But with Mount Zion, come and enter in. The gracious invitation no one could please God on Sinai's terms, which was perfect fulfillment of the law. Those that had pride in thinking that they were keeping the law, no one could keep it. That's why in Colossians 3, or Galatians 3.13, it talked about cursed as one who was hung on a tree. Jesus Christ would die on the cross. Zion, however, is accessible to all who come to God through Jesus Christ. There's only one way. Just like that hymn we were singing, the way of the cross leads home. You can't bypass the cross. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. He didn't say, create some way to come. There's only one way. And that's through Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you say, I, I think I can get to heaven by my works. I, I think I'm a good enough man or a good enough woman that he will say, come on in. God is a just God. He is holy. And that is why there had to be a payment for sins. That's why Jesus Christ had to come to this earth and go to the cross that the sins of all the world were put upon Jesus at the cross. It's only by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in his completed work, that we have access to our heavenly home, amen? Can you imagine the boasting would happen? There's no boasting going to be able to be in heaven because we're all needy of God's grace. We're all guilty sinners. But if we could be saved by works, the boasting that would be going on. We're saved by grace through faith alone. When you start adding even one thing to grace, you no longer have grace because grace is unearned favor of God. The believers in the, the Galatians, those Judaizers kept saying, we want to do this and you have to do this and this. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law. You have to do all these things. And that's not true. The Apostle Paul said, if anybody comes to you and preaching another gospel that other than I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The message is, it's salvation by grace through faith alone. There's no works. We belong to a festal assembly, a gathering. Notice this in verse 22. In heaven, there are myriads of angels. It can be angels. And then it says in beginning verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn ones. Literally, the, the church of the firstborn ones. New Testament believers from the day of Pentecost to the last one to be saved before the rapture of the church. The church. Redeemed the body of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the trump's going to sound and the Lord is going to come in the air and the church is going to be caught up to be forever with the Lord. Oh, there's comfort there, isn't it? In fact, Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18 with the teaching of the rapture of the church, comfort one another with these words. This is not the end. Maybe you've had a loved one 
that died. Went, at the, went on home. A loved one that knew the Lord Jesus Christ safely home. And you hear her saying, is there comfort? Yeah. The very teaching that we're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ and that we're going to be with other believers reunited to be forever with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. And then he goes on and says, The church who are enrolled in heaven. Remember when the disciples came back and they said to the Lord, we went and we did these things in your name and uh, cast out demons and various things that happened, all these things. And you know what the Lord says? Don't rejoice in, in all those things. Rejoice that your name is in heaven. Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You know what? There's going to be a lot of names recorded on church rolls, but people might have been depending upon their church membership for salvation. Don't get me wrong, church membership's important, but it doesn't save anybody. Nobody can be saved from church membership. Baptism is important. But nobody is saved by water baptism. The Lord's table that we're going to be partaking of today, the Lord's table is important. But partaking of the Lord's table doesn't save us. The Lord says, remember. It's remembrance of Jesus Christ. It's a three-way look, looking back to Calvary. Inward, Lord, examine me. And looking forward, we do this until he comes. It's a look three ways. But it doesn't save us. Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Is your name recorded? And then the Bible says, and to God, the judge of all. He's the righteous judge. Dr. J. Vernon McGee rightly wrote, I thank God that when I get into the presence of the judge of all, there is one who will already have paid the penalty for my sins and my record will be clear. How do we know that? Friend, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, Jesus, his Son, who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our sins were placed upon Jesus at the cross, that believing in him, his righteousness would be applied to our account. That's why Paul would write in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God. We are justified by faith. We are declared righteous by Almighty God because he sees the righteousness of his Son. That is how we can pray in Jesus' name, praying on the basis of Jesus' completed work and his righteousness, not my righteousness. The God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. I believe, as a lot of Bible commentators write, that these are the Old Testament saints. But then we get to verse 24. We are come to the blood of Jesus. To the blood of Jesus. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Oh, friend, I'm so thankful for the new covenant. 
I'm thankful because Jesus Christ died on the cross and, and was able to say, it is finished. The sin debt is paid in full. Because what Jesus Christ did, we didn't bring a lamb with us this morning to come together. I was listening, I love that song that Greater Vision sings that says, put out the fire. No more animal sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, has died once and for all. He's the Savior. He's the mediator of the new covenant shed his most precious blood. Go back a couple chapters to Hebrews chapter 9, please. Verses 11 to 14. The Bible says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, if, if that was sufficient, if the blood of bulls or goats, then why would Jesus go to the cross? But that was a mere shadow, wasn't it? It was a mere shadow. But Jesus came. And in verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much more? The precious blood of Jesus Christ he shed his most precious blood. So as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. F.B. Meyer wrote years ago, the blood of Jesus speaks better things than Abel's. Abel's blood was the blood of martyrdom. But Jesus' blood of sacrifice. Abel's blood accursed as it cried from the ground. The blood of Jesus pleads for mercy. That denounced wrath, the blood of Abel, Jesus' blood proclaims reconciling love. Abel's blood crying out from the ground led to punishment. Remember for Cain? But Jesus' blood cries out issues and salvation. Abel's blood was crying out unto death. Jesus' blood is crying out unto life. There's life in the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus, friend, cries out more than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus Christ. There's another hymn that we sing once in a while. And I want to close and I, as I ask you this question. As the hymn writer says, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you're not fully trusting in His grace, the completed work of Jesus Christ at the cross, you may be here today and say, 
Oh, you don't know all the things that I've done. There's no way I could be forgiven. I want to remind your friend, there was a man hanging on the cross beside our Savior. And that man said, we deserve death for what we've done. He was a guilty sinner deserving death. But he found hope. He'd heard the mockery, the first gospel track hanging above our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the King of the Jews. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. This day, you will be with me in paradise. That man was hanging on a cross. What works could he do? If salvation was by any work, was there any hope for him? But because salvation is by grace through faith alone, he was able to call out to Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. That was a guilty sinner that said, I'm deserving of death. So friend, if you're here and you say, I've done so many things, could I be forgiven? God's answer to you is, yes. 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 In fact, he would say, the arm of the Lord is not shortened, that he is not able to save. He's able to save. You may have come in here today and you are needing the Savior. Don't turn him away. Maybe you've had that tugging at your heart before, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, showing you your need for Jesus Christ. And you've said, no, no, some other time, some other time. Don't put him off. Will you say yes today? The Apostle Paul said, this is the appointed time. This is the day of salvation. This is the time. Oh, I would plead with you to listen to the Lord. Believe on him. Be saved. The Bible says we've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, we've missed the mark of his perfection. And because of that, every one of us deserve damnation. We deserve hell. The wages of sin is death, being separated. We deserve to be separated from God forever and ever. But what he gives, the gift, what we don't deserve, but what God gives is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How's it possible? But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You may be here today and you may know it up here, but you never acted on what you know. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession unto salvation. And then Romans 10, 13 says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.